Um, so, uh, first it gave this, I don't know, there's a subtitle, there's a pre-title, Post-Keynesian Perspectives on Open Economy Macroeconomics. But that doesn't limit the topic enough. It's still an enormous topic. One could have a whole course or several courses on that. Um, so to give today's lecture uh, a focus, I decided I would have a theme. And it's kind of a theme we've heard a little bit about in some of the, or a lot about actually, in some of the earlier presentations in regard to domestic economies. But now we take it to the international realm. And that is conflict versus cooperation and specifically in international trade relations. Um, and I'm going to start with something that may be a funny starting point uh, because this is supposed to be an open economy lecture, a macro lecture. I promise I will get to macro. Um, but I'm going to start with a sort of a foil, which is the neoclassical theory of trade, the orthodox view. Uh, what everybody is taught in their introductory course and on up to graduate school about the marvels of comparative advantage. And in that approach, I think it's fair to say that international trade relations are uh, portrayed as generally cooperative. The best thing countries could do is just lower all their barriers, and if any country imposes a tariff or other barrier, it's only hurting itself. It's not really hurting anyone else. Um, all countries can gain by specializing according to their comparative advantage. There are some footnotes or caveats to this. The famous doppler samuelson theorem tells us that the owners of the scarce factor of production in a country will lose, or may lose, under certain assumptions, may lose absolutely. And there are many other updated versions of that where some group loses either absolutely or relatively. But in all cases, there's always net efficiency gains. So the gains to the winners outweigh the losses to the losers. And as a result, the nation as a whole benefits. And this happens for all countries. So, and that's the sense in which I mean that trade is portrayed as cooperative, that everyone can gain from doing the same thing, which is lowering their trade barriers. Um, I should tell you that I spent a lot of my summer reading Caldor. So, so today's presentation was heavily influenced by, by that. Uh, and as Caldor emphasized many, many years ago, I think now more than uh, 50 years ago, uh, this optimistic view or cooperative view of trade rests on a number of very strong assumptions. Constant returns to scale, full employment, perfect competition, exogenously given factor endowments and technology, and the idea that trade can be analyzed in abstraction from macroeconomics and monetary relations. Trade is simply barter, and money and finance don't matter. Um, and as Caldor emphasized 50 years ago, uh, he and later post-Keynesians have rejected all of these assumptions. In the real world, we find pervasive increasing returns to scale, which by the way, the mainstream has now discovered, um, involuntary unemployment, uh, chronically imbalanced trade, and pervasive oligopoly and monopoly power. Furthermore, some of the factor, the factor endowments, so-called factor endowments, particularly capital, are endogenous. Capital is accumulated, it's not uh, endowed. Uh, competitive advantages, I will call them that instead of comparative advantages, are created rather than inherited. Um, technology is also not exogenously given. And the monetary and financial aspects of uh, trade relations cannot be ignored. Now, this, I promise, is not a lecture on trade theory. But uh, the implication of all this is that when you don't accept all of those strong assumptions, it turns out that trade relations could be conflictive as well as cooperative. And here I have a serious disagreement with the speakers earlier today. They use the word conflictual. And I use conflictive. <laughs> Actually, no, that's not a serious, <laughs> that, that's a joke. Uh, that it's been a perennial source of uh, disagreement in the heterodox literature about whether we say conflictive or co uh, conflictual. But as far as I can tell, there's no substantive difference. So I assume we, we mean the same thing. Um, so just to give a, a few early uh, ideas on this, Joan Robinson in her, I think, much neglected but really important 1947 book on the uh, theory of employment, 
uh, borrowed from Adam Smith, but updated his idea that, well, he, Adam Smith said that protectionism was beggar my neighbor, and she called all sorts of trade policies, and especially currency policies like devaluation, beggar thy neighbor uh, policies. And then Kaldor, when he began his work that I'll talk about more in a few minutes, on cumulative causation and unequal regional growth, argued that some countries' gains could come at the expense of other countries. And so that's where we turn to the macro side, because it's really a question of uh, the fact that we cannot view trade in isolation from uh, the macro environment. And I'm going to uh, go through some of the uh, heterodox uh, macro theories of, of, of open economies organized according to sort of time perspective, where it's really more analytical perspective, short run, medium run, and long run, um, where for the short run, I will use a neo Koletskian open economy model, um, and the focus is on competitive advantages and unit labor costs. For the medium run, I will focus on the Caldorian approach, which includes Verdorn's law to endogenize productivity growth and take account of scale economies. Um, and for the long run, I will focus on the model of balance of payments constrained growth due to Thorwall and, and many others. Uh, by the way, there's a nice article by Rafael Ribeiro from Brazil and two co-authors, uh, Gilberto Lima and uh, John McCombe, which has this sort of short run, medium run, long run distinction but they do it all in a balance of payments constrained growth framework, even applied to the short run and the medium run. So I, I, I will we'll use the same time periods, but not the same modeling approach. So when I sat down to think about this, I realized that in terms of the, the neo Koletskian approach, uh, the issue of cooperation versus conflict relates very much to the discussion that I assume most of you most of you are familiar with about whether the economy is wage-led or profit-led. And particularly here to be clear, I'm talking about whether aggregate demand is wage-led or profit-led, since for the economy as a whole, there's a lot of other considerations. And the notation is simply that pi is the profit share. So at the most basic level, uh, if we think about aggregate demand as the sum of consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports, uh, we think that a rise in the profit share would probably have the following effects. Negative on consumption, uh, because you know, workers have a much higher marginal propensity to consume than recipients of profits, and therefore including both firms and wealthy investors. So uh, raising the share going to the latter would decrease consumption. Investment, Probably positive, though maybe not strongly so. This is an issue that Antonella spoke about in her presentation this morning. Um, on government purchases, probably not a strong effect at all, and I won't talk about that anymore, but you could make some arguments one way or the other, but probably no effect, and in the empirical literature, I'm not aware of anyone who's tried to estimate that. And then for net exports, the effect is probably positive, not, not because higher ex uh, profits promote exports, but rather because a higher profit share is the same thing as a lower labor share, and that means uh, lower labor costs relative to foreign prices, and uh, if labor costs are reduced, then the country's products would become more competitive. Um, but I should also point out that the, the international competition dimension can come through here not only in the net export term, where it's more obvious, uh, but also in regard to investment. If countries are open to foreign investment, and there's FDI going on, foreign direct investment, if there are global value chains, so either with or without FDI, if local firms are participating in global value chains, or foreign firms are deciding where to locate their production, there's a certain amount of attractiveness of going to a country that has lower labor costs, you know, holding other factors like quality and, and so on uh, constant. So in that sense, uh, mobility of uh, productive capital can uh, strengthen the positive effect on investment. Now here are some 
classic results, these are from a while ago, a uh, 2012 study uh, for the International Labor Organization by uh, Unran and Galanis, and these results have been republished in many places. Uh, and what they did was, as I seek to master the technology of using the pointer and the microphone at the same time, they looked at the effects of an, a one percentage point increase in the profit share on the consumption output ratio, the investment output ratio, and the net export to output ratio, and then the sum of those. You'll see I've whited something out here. It's actually a typo in the original. It says it's multiplied by a multiplier, but when I added up the numbers, they just add up. So these are simply A plus B plus C, and they're not multiplied by the multiplier. Sorry. It's 11 years later I found the typo, a little late. Um, but it doesn't matter, because we're interested in the signs. Uh, and uh, if something is zero, that means the effect was statistically insignificant. Uh, basic conclusion, and I think you heard this again from Antonella uh, this morning, so I'm only reinforcing what, what she said. Uh, all the economies, and I think this is true in the, in the larger literature, are, sorry, I'm having trouble with this uh, pointer thing, are domestically wage-led. That is, the sum of consumption plus investment uh, is negatively affected by a rise in the profit share. So even where there is a statistically significant positive effect on investment, it's always smaller than the negative effect on consumption, which is, which is dominant domestically. And so the difference between wage-led and profit-led demand regimes then hinges on what is found for net exports. And for those countries uh, that are found to be profit-led, that would be the positive signs in this last column, it's usually net exports that make the difference. Uh, so the open economy dimension is quite strong. And the results, now, I, you know, this literature has been going on for a long, long time, and this type of work has been roundly criticized. I've published criticisms of it. But there's actually something incredibly uh, plausible and believable about these results, even if you don't exactly believe the precise numbers. Uh, because what they found, and, and I, I cite them because they were the first study that did a broad international comparison, including some emerging and developing countries. And they found that it was the smaller and more open economies that tend to be more profit-led. So South Africa, India slightly, China very strongly, Argentina somewhat, Korea more strongly, no, I'm sorry, um, not Korea, Mexico rather, Canada and Australia, all of which are extremely uh, open economies. Whereas the larger, richer, and more closed economies, such as United States, EU 12, Germany, etc., are found to be wage-led overall in the sense that the effects on net exports are not large enough to outweigh the effects on domestic demand. Uh, now, what does this have to do with uh, a conflict? Well, if a country has a profit-led demand regime because of the net export effect being so strong, uh, that means that if the country either devalues its currency or represses wages relative to productivity, it would make gains in uh, output, growth, etc., and that its trading partner, if they have a profit-led regime, also would suffer losses in all those uh, dimensions. So it would be a case where those uh, net export effects are very strong that you would find a, a situation of conflict. If a country has a, a wage-led regime overall, the story is a little more complicated, but the conflict does not completely go away. So in that situation, cutting wages or devaluing the currency does not bring a gain in output and employment, just the opposite, it, it reduces them. And nevertheless, it can bring a gain on the net export side. And, and, and then the, the, the converse of that is that cutting wages, uh, no, I said it as cutting wages, so, but cutting wages would still improve external competitiveness. And so the conflict element remains for trade, and that's important as we move into the uh, uh, medium run, which we need to do very soon, um, 
because if your trade balance rises or falls, this is going to affect the composition of your country's industries. If export industries don't grow, they won't get dynamic scale economies, you won't be able to diversify into new products and new sectors. Um, and if your imports are rising strongly, it's going to crowd out domestic production in various sectors. So uh, even though there's not a benefit to the whole economy, there's still a benefit to the tradable goods sectors. Now I'm cognizant of the time, so I'm going to have to skip a bunch of slides. Uh, I mean, just as I was saying before, it, there's many criticisms of this methodology. There's many newer studies since uh, that work was done, but I think there's still a core story there that is, is plausible. And I'm going to just skip some of this uh, and summarize the short run so that we uh, leave time for questions and discussion. So the main point is that for the short run, international conflict is most intense for countries that have profit-led demand when that profit-led demand occurs because of strong negative effects of unit labor costs on investment and net exports. In that case, the gains in market shares, output, and employment for some countries come at the expense of losses for others. This conflict is mitigated to some extent if overall demand is wage-led, but international competition still affects net exports and that has consequences for the composition of domestic industries with potential medium-run and long-run implications, which I will now turn to. By the way, these presentations will be online after the conference, so you can see all the si slides I have to skip for reasons of time uh, later. All right. The medium run. As I said, I spent a lot of my uh, summer reading Caldor because I owe somebody a book chapter related to him. And uh, it was, it was quite inspirational, and I, I do recommend if you haven't done it or haven't done it for a while to go read some of Caldor's original essays from the 1960s and 70s and into the 80s on, the, on these topics, as well as Caldor's writings on almost anything else, like, like money, uh, just for example. Uh, but in 1966, he began a stream of articles and publications where he began to address what he called uneven development between either regions within a country or countries in the global economy, or global regions like North and South. So he called them regions, and, and the concept can be applied uh, pretty broadly. And in his first attack on this in 1966, which was an essay on explaining the causes of slow growth in the United Kingdom, uh, he argued that overall growth in the economy was driven by growth of manufacturers, and he had some early statistical evidence to back that up. And that manufacturing production has the unique, or at least at that time, unique attribute that it's characterized by strong increasing returns to scale. And he meant both static and dynamic increasing returns, and he included in that concept induced technological innovation. And there he cited the work of great economists going all the way back to Adam Smith with his concept of the division of labor, followed in the 20th century by Alan Young, Kenneth Arrow, and P.J. Verdurn. And then a second point in Caldor 66 article, here I'm not going to focus on the part about the UK, but just the broader principles that he enunciated then, was that another really essential part of the growth process is the reallocation of labor from agriculture to manufacturers, which uh, historically has raised average productivity and boosted uh, aggregate growth. In 1970, in the essay called something about regional economics, uh, he added one other intellectual inspiration, which was the Swedish development economist Gunnar Myrdal's idea of cumulative causation, in which positive feedbacks make success self-reinforcing or else make failure self-reinforcing. And a couple of quotes here hint at the, or not only hint, they, they state that this leads to conflict between the countries in the sense that I'm defining it, or regions. Uh, one is that the region that is initially more developed industrially may gain from the progressive opening of trade at the expense of the less developed region. 
trade may injure one region to the greater benefit uh, of the other. And notice this could come about from an opening the trade. So whereas in 1947, Robinson was focused on protectionism or devaluation or trade barriers and subsidies, sort of interventionist policies, actually free trade itself can lead to this outcome. Uh, Robinson later came around to that view also. Um, this is a chart I've put in several articles in my book with Mark Setterfield. Uh, which illustrates this idea of what we call export-led growth with cumulative causation. Um, so because it's cumulative, you could start at any point in it. Why don't we start with the exports at the bottom here? So by the way, it's not so bad. I flipped ahead by mistake. In the notation I use, it's from the book, uh, for quantity variables, growth rates are indicated by lowercase letters, like little x is the growth rate of exports x. But for nominal variables, uh, rates of change are indicated by hats or circumflexes, like p hat is the inflation rate for the level p. And subscript f's indicate foreign variables. So, uh, so if a country has faster growth of exports, this leads to Keynesian multiplier effects, increased utilization of capacity, it stimulates investment, all of those lead to faster growth of output. Faster growth of output then passes through Verdorn's law, which is the expression, I'll show you the equation in a moment, for the increasing returns to scale and induced technological innovation. Those in turn lead to faster growth of labor productivity. I'm definitely having trouble with the technology. Uh, Q, little Q in our notation is the growth rate of labor productivity, little y is the growth rate of output. And then if firms uh, use markup pricing and holding for present purposes the markup's constant uh, with productivity rising faster. Also, by the way, uh, Caldor took nominal wages uh, increases as given. I think that's a questionable assumption, but that was his assumption uh, based on the fact that wage patterns tend to be stable in, in, in studies from that time. Um, so then the home country's prices will rise more slowly relative to the uh, foreign prices converted by the exchange rate. So the rate of depreciation, rate of real depreciation will increase, or you could say the real exchange rate depreciates. Uh, and then that in turn, sorry. Ah, I'm trying to reach equilibrium in my uh, slides. <laughs> If the export demand function has a reasonably high relative price elasticity, that would then feed back into additional increases in export growth, and so the whole process would uh, expand more and more. Now, what I've depicted with these upward arrows is success breeding more success, which I am not having with the pointer. Um, I seem to be suffering diminishing rather than increasing returns. Um, but we, if I put down our downward arrows in all these little boxes here, we would see failure breeding more failure. So countries whose exports grow more slowly would have less uh, rapid growth of output, their productivity growth would slow down, their competitiveness would, in price terms would worsen, and then their exports would grow yet even more slowly. When you mathematize this, um, this is pretty much, I mean, there's a number of references here. The first version of this was Dixon and Thorwall in 1975. Setterfield and Cornwall have an excellent presentation of it in 2002. We put it in our book, and Mark and I have covered it in other writings. Uh, but essentially, one equation represents each of those arrows in the diagram. The first equation is an export demand function. The second one is a markup pricing equation, but with a constant markup. So the rate of price inflation, and this is related to Mark Lavoie's presentation. In that case, if the markup is stable, it just equals the rate of wage inflation minus the rate of productivity growth. Productivity growth is an increasing function of, sorry, output growth following Ferdorn's law. And then there's some kind of multiplier relationship relating export growth to output growth. And I'll spare you all the details for reasons of time. Uh, if you then assume 
a similar set of equations for the foreign country with some symmetry assumptions that are really just simplifying assumptions. They're not necessary. Uh, so here, in these symmetry assumptions, which are only one way to close the model, uh, the, oh, sorry, I really apologize. The constant terms in the Verdun relations are assumed to be equal, but the um, Verdun coefficients, the, the endogenous effects of output growth or productivity growth vary, but you, you could let the other ones vary too. And sparing you a bunch of simple algebra, uh, this leads to, you could boil the four equations down into two, which Setterfield and Cornwall call the productivity regime, that's just the, the Verdorn equation, and the demand regime, which is the other three equations combined, and it has somewhat paradoxically from Caldor, who wrote an article criticizing equilibrium economics, but it has an equilibrium solution, y star equals this uh, expression, and that can be shown as a graph relating output growth to labor productivity growth, and both of those relationships, the demand regime and productivity regime, were upward sloping. If the productivity regime one is steeper, then there's a stable and positive equilibrium, and that requires, in turn, that essentially the cumulative causation, all of this, these positive feedbacks, are not too strong. Otherwise, there would be no equilibrium in the first quadrant, and uh, the, uh, the system would be extremely unstable, to put it mildly. Um, now, what does this all have to do with conflict? Well, to bring it back to that theme, um, if you go back to the math for this, for the demand regime, the intercept is the uh, Greek letter uppercase omega, which in turn is an amalgam of these various uh, elasticities and other parameters. And specifically, I want you to focus on the ones first in the red circle, and then we'll talk about the green circle. Because I do want to emphasize, post-Keynesian models do not only show the possibility of conflict, they also show avenues for cooperation. And I want to show you where both of them uh, are found here. Um, so remember, we're looking inside the intercept term of the demand regime equation. And if you focus on the two terms circled in red, uh, these have negative effects. So these are things that will pull down the intercept and lower the growth for this country, lower its whole, you know, it, its virtuous circle will become less virtuous or maybe a vicious circle. Um, one of them is the price elasticity of its exports multiplied by the foreign Verdun coefficient, uh, all multiplied by foreign output growth. And the other negative term is, again, the price elasticity of, of uh, exports multiplied by the intercept of the home country Verdun relation. So basically what's happening here is if, well, I, if any of my technical assistants are here, I would appreciate someone getting this back into um, uh, full screen. Anyone in those? Can you? Control. Is that, is control string? Yeah. Yes. Control, what? F? L. L. Oh, cool. Ah, huh? perfect. Okay. It's a German keyboard, so it doesn't say control. Uh, but basically, if foreign productivity growth accelerates relative to the home country, for either of those reasons, um, it won't just help the foreign country, it will actually hurt the home country. Because the home country will now be getting less export growth as the foreign products squeeze it out of the inter international markets and take over a bigger market share. And so the home country economy will actually slow down in all those dimensions. So that's the room for conflict. And of course, it, it, it works in reverse. If the home country was to accelerate its uh, productivity growth, it would be harmful to the foreign country. The room for cooperation is found by circling the two terms in green, which are the income elasticity of export demand minus that term for the foreign Verdurm coefficient times the uh, price elasticity of exports times foreign export growth. So these are the two places 
where the foreign country's actions could have a positive effect on the home country, considered together, uh, particularly if the foreign country adopts uh, expansionary demand policies that would raise YF. Um, notice that multiplies this whole term in parentheses, and I think there's good reasons to assume that term, term in parentheses is positive, because most estimates of income elasticities of exports are greater than unity, most Hmm. Oh, my. There we go. Most estimates of these two uh, parameters are usually less than one, so if you multiply them, it's even less, less than one, more or less than one, uh, and so it's probably a positive difference. So that means that uh, increased growth of the foreign economy in, in and of itself has a positive effect on the home country. So that, for example, uh, cooperative fiscal expansions um, could be of mutual benefit. These are some uh, curves that we had in our book, but I actually redrew them for this presentation. We, I had the, we had them as straight lines in the book that show convergence or di divergence, which simply depends on which country starts out ahead, the fast-growing country or the, the slow-going country. Um, in the first graph, uh, let's say the home country, let's say the, the country A is, is the leader uh, country, whereas in the second graph, it's the country that's catching up. Uh, A is the fast-growing country here, B is the slower-growing country, and then uh, the, the, I made the curves bend to make the point that over time, what one country does will affect the other. So, for example, in the first part here, if, let's say, uh, a, a, an advanced economy is racing ahead at, at, at a certain point in time, it will start to push down the growth of the other country. Or in this case, if the fast-growing country is the less developed country but that's doing catch-up, it will actually pull down the growth of the more advanced economy but the one that is slowing down, somewhat like Caldor's United Kingdom of the 1960s. I have a few other examples uh, listed uh, down here. Now, there's a number of important qualifications to this model, uh, which is suggestive, but I wouldn't always take it too literally. First of all, the model is aggregative. But if you go back and read the original ideas from Caldor, uh, they require a disaggregated framework. Uh, the positive feedbacks are supposed to exist in manufacturing, some other industries, and I think we would now add what we call modern services like information technology, um, but uh, they're not supposed to apply to agriculture, more traditional services, uh, and maybe they don't apply all that much to some very light manufacturing. So disaggregating the model and incorporating structural change is really important. And if you're looking at the model by itself, you should think of it as reflecting the industrial sector of an economy and not all the sectors. A lot of work has been done on disaggregation and structural change, but it's been done more in the long run framework I will get to, the Thorwald model, so I'm going to save it until we get there. Secondly, just a qualification or clarification. You may remember this from the, one of the quotes I, I, I had from Caldor. He originally spoke of this case here on the left, where it's the more advanced economy that is holding back the progress of the less developed economy. But there is a second possibility, which is that, let's say, a, a, a China or Japan in an earlier era could be catching up, and that could be inhibiting the growth of the previously more advanced economy, and even catching up or surpassing it. And by 1981, Caldor had uh, modified his presentation to make it clear he was talking about fast-growing and slow-growing economies rather than uh, more advanced and less advanced economies. Another important qualification is to be careful uh, about the fact that in the model, for simplicity, there's only two countries, home and foreign, or A and B, but in reality, there's many, many countries in the world. Um, Again, Caldor discussed this more than we have been able so far to put it in our models. Uh, but there's certainly the possibility that a number of uh, countries could join the club of advanced economies 
US, Europe, Canada, Japan, et cetera, um, and, or at least certain countries in Europe. And then those countries would be the ones that had the most scale economies, innovation, uh, rapidly growing productivity, and so on. Um, and the way they would do this would be by specializing in different things. Uh, you know, famous examples include Germany specializing in chemicals, while the United States specialized in aerospace, something like that. A few decades ago. Um, so it is certainly possible. It's not just like only one country can benefit. Yes, several countries could benefit at once, but probably not all the countries in the world. And those countries that do get stuck specializing in primary products uh, would be severely inhibited in their industrial development. They might get deindustrialized. This has been a huge concern, for example, in Brazil for the last 20, 25 years now. Um, you, know, you can also get gains from that trade. You know, it's a different kind of gain, a more traditional comparative advantage gain from exporting primary commodities, especially if you get high prices for them, as the South American countries did in the early 2000s. But we know it's not a stable path to uh, sustainable growth. All right, I'm again looking at my time. And... Let me do one more slide here and then move on to the long run. Um, this is uh, in homage to my co-author, Mark Setterfield, who couldn't be here this year. Um, why did I call this a medium-run model? It's called a growth model, so why do I say it's medium-run and not long-run? Well, I think very deliberately, the model does not portray a true steady state. For example, full employment is not guaranteed, balanced trade is not guaranteed, so even in that so-called equilibrium I showed you, it's only an equilibrium of those two relationships. It's not an equilibrium for the economy uh, as a whole. And even then, a, a real-world economy would normally spend most of its time not in such an equilibrium, but moving toward it from one side or the other. And then while a country is in such a growth path, which we might call a traverse or transition toward an equilibrium state, the country might never reach there, in fact, very likely would never reach the equilibrium before the underlying parameters would change. Now, those parameters could change because of exogenous reasons, politics, wars, etc., but they could also change and often do change because of endogenous transformations. That is, a particular growth regime, if you think of it as a, a combination of a, a demand regime and a productivity regime, and the underlying social relationships, uh, political compromises, can lead to transformations that then shift those very uh, regimes. So one example would be that if the productivity regime relied on a certain technological paradigm, and then that becomes exhausted, then the growth potential from that will, will wear out. Another possibility is that the labor movement could get either strengthened or weakened by a particular growth path and then that would shift some of the parameters. Um, and I do believe that adjustments in wages and exchange rates could take place. We've seen in China, for example, after years in which it was considered the low-wage country, wages have risen very strongly in China. The currency has appreciated to some extent. And today, the industries that depend the most on low wages have moved away from China to other countries. Uh, and China's kind of moving up the technological ladder, which then brings me to another source of sort of uh, endogenous change in these relationships, which is technological diffusion. As these technologies uh, develop, firms may export the technology to other countries and set up production platforms in other areas or license the technology, and then uh, countries and like say Korea and China have been the best examples will start to develop their own innovative capacity. I say that as I sit here with my Samsung uh, uh, cell phone. Okay, so I'm afraid I'm going to have to uh, accelerate to the long run or uh, we won't reach our own equilibrium and, and end in time. So for the long run I'm going to focus on the theory of balance of payments constrained growth uh, I do want to signal that for many heterodox economists, the very idea of a long-run analysis is problematic, and some of our leading luminaries who you've heard a lot about today 
have expressed skeptical views of long-run analysis. Kaletsky once famously, actually more than once, he said things like, the long-run trend is but a slowly changing component of a change of short period situations. It has no independent entity. And Caldor, in his 1972 article uh, criticizing equilibrium economics, stated, the actual state of the economy during any one period cannot be predicted except as a result of the sequence of events in previous periods which led up to it. So in other words, there is strong path dependency, uh, and so there is no predetermined uh, long-run steady state to which the economy is driven. Other branches of heterodox and post-Keynesian economics take a more favorable view toward long-run analysis. I don't have time to go into all of this. I think some of it was addressed by Antonella this morning. And one thing she mentioned in particular is the supermultiplier models, uh, which emphasize a long-run steady state driven by growth of what they call autonomous demand, where autonomous means independent of uh, income of the, own, the country's own national income and non-capacity creating. And for an open economy, the leading uh, suspect for being autonomous demand is exports, which is dependent on foreign countries' income but not on home income and is not at least directly uh, capacity creating. Though of course, it may induce investment, but that's, that's part of the story. Um, and so that led to the model of balance of payments constrained growth, first developed by Tony Thorwall in an article by himself, and another one that is also worth reading with Dixon in 1979. And uh, just a few basic assumptions. Now, for reasons of time, I can only show you the, the simplest, most basic version, and I will talk about a few extensions of the model only as they're relevant to our general theme. But in the basic model, it does assume that trade has to be balanced in the long run, not in the short run or the medium, but in the long run, or else, in extensions with capital flows, there has to be some kind of sustainable current account imbalance or debt to GDP ratio. Goods are nationally differentiated and are imperfect substitutes. That's actually the same as the implicit assumption in the neo models for the short run. Supplies are infinitely elastic with prices fixed in seller's currency. So that's essentially all those horizontal marginal cost curves that Mark uh, Lavoie showed us. Uh, and very importantly, output, or the growth rate of output, is the adjusting variable in the long run. That's the Keynesian element. And in the traditional version of, I call it BPCG, for balance of payments constrained growth, relative prices, usually measured by the real exchange rate, are either constant, not that they never change, but that they have you know, a flat long run trend, or else the elasticities, the price elasticities, the epsilons in my model are so low that the price changes have little effect. Uh, I don't want to throw too many equations at you this late in the afternoon, but basically you have the same export demand function, except now I'm putting the exchange rate change in, the nominal exchange rate in explicitly. We left it out above just because we did. And now we add in an import demand equation similarly specified and impose a balance of payments constraint. This is the simplest version, which just says that the growth rate of exports in nominal terms in home currency must equal the growth rate of the value of imports also in home currency. And remember that an increase in E here, the exchange rate is a depreciation. The exchange rate is home currency per unit of foreign currency. Um, if you just solve those put those equations together and solve them for uh, the growth rate of output, you get this equation up here, uh, where it's a function of the change in the real exchange rate multiplied by the sum of the two price elasticities minus one. If you've studied your old-fashioned mainstream uh, international finance, you know that those are the Marshall Lerner elasticities, and then all divided by the income elasticity of import demand, Oh, and on the right here, very important in the numerator, is the income elasticity of export demand times foreign income. Now, Thurwall and his followers have always made one of two assumptions to get rid of these relative price terms. So you can either assume elasticity pessimism, which means that the, relative, uh, the, sorry, the, the price elasticities 
are no more than about one sum together. These are, by the way, absolute values, um, so they're defined as positive, uh, in which case that term is zero, or else there's no uh, change in the real exchange rate in the long run, and so then this term is zero. And if either of those terms is zero, and I've got to the right slide, it simplifies to this expression, um, uh, which is one version of Thirlwall's law. So uh, I have to say Tony Thirlwall was quite remarkable because within a year or two after uh, he published this article, people were talking about Thirlwall's law. So if, if you get a law named after yourself early in, you know, in uh, your work, uh, you're, you're really in luck. And here I really have to uh, remember someone we lost either this year or last year, Jonathan Perriton, who uh, is well known for his work on this theory, but also did so much other work in heterodox economics and development economics, and is just is a really terrific person. Anyway, Jonathan defined the two versions of Thirlwall's law as the strong form and the weak form. The strong form is what you get from that math above, the balance of payments constrained growth rate just equals the ratio of the income elasticity of exports over the income elasticity of imports multiplied by foreign income. If you make the second assumption to get rid of the relative prices, that the real exchange rate is constant in the long run, I did it again, Strig L, there. Now I know that better in German than in English. Uh, under this assumption only, you get the weak form but I think the most popular form of Thirlwall's law, which is just the export growth rate over the income elasticity of import demand. Um, I'm going to skip these slides to stick on our theme. So uh, this all goes back a long time. Over the intervening, I guess it's about a little more than 40 years now, 44 years, uh, an enormous number of extensions and uh, more complex versions of the balance of payments constrained growth model have been developed. Um, they're surveyed in uh, my book with Mark and another recent article I published in the JOES, Journal of Economic Surveys. Extensions to two large countries instead of just a single country, structural change, uh, reincorporating real exchange rate effects, but as I'll show you in a different way, comparing small versus large countries, Bringing Verdorn's law, that got dropped out, you'll notice, because you've gotten rid of the relative price effects. But what if you try to bring them back in? Making the income elasticities endogenous, international capital flows, ecological constraints, and distributive cycles. And I'm sure I've left something out here, so I apologize to anyone who's published an article with a, an additional uh, extension uh, of this literature. Now, there's also a lot of overlap. These are not exclusive categories. There are, for example, models with structural change and real exchange rate effects and Verdorn's law. Uh, so you could put more than uh, two or more of these uh, together. But for reasons of time, I will just focus on a few of these that have something to say about conflict versus cooperation. So the first one is a very neat extension of the uh, model now I guess it's 30 years old by John. This is well making me feel old. Uh, two large countries by John McCombie in 1993, and uh, it's actually easiest to explain with the graph. So you have the income of the two countries on the axes. If the trade is balanced, you would be on the green line, the balance of payments constraint line. But each country's aggregate demand is a function of the other country's, or each country's growth is a function of the other country's growth. So that's called the aggregate demand relation. And the one for the uh, con home country A has to be steeper than the one for the foreign country B. So those are shown in red and blue. And the idea here is, um, what if, and I've got to state my, let's say, the home country A here tries to stimulate its economy. Let's say they use a domestic stimulus, fiscal stimulus, for example, or investment incentives uh, to boost growth. So they move from the uh, thicker red dashed line to the smaller red dotted line there. Um, if the foreign country does not stimulate, the foreign country's 
aggregate demand curve stays at this lower blue line, and the equilibrium moves from E0 to E1. That puts you in the region where country A, the home country, has a deficit, a trade deficit or current account deficit, and B has a surplus. And these surpluses and deficits would accumulate over time, creating a big debt of country A relative to country B, which would be unsustainable. So if country B just refuses to budge, then country A will be forced to uh, reverse its stimulus policy and accept the lower growth rate. Whereas, if the foreign country is willing to cooperate by pursuing a simultaneous and coordinated expansion, then the equilibrium would shift to point E2, or could shift to point E2, which is back on the balance of payments constrained growth line, and then both countries' faster growth would be sustainable. So you, cooperation can be mutually, uh, can exist in this model, but there's conflict potentially if one country doesn't, doesn't want to reciprocate. Now, another important extension uh, with a lot of applications to developing countries is the so-called multi-sectoral Thorwald's Law, MSTL, developed originally by Ricardo Araujo and Gilberto Lima uh, from Brazil, and uh, then also in a series of later articles. And this is a model that's been widely used to represent structural change in, in this framework. I'm going to give you the math, which I assure you is much easier, from a later paper by Gouveia and Lima, 2013, which simply, okay, I'm gonna try to do this without moving the slide, depicts the numerator and denominator as weighted averages of the income elasticities of exports and imports for the individual goods I, uh, weighted by industry or good shares of total exports and shares of total uh, imports. So it just makes the point, but very explicitly, and Thorwald had always recognized this, that, that the aggregate income elasticities are weighted averages of those for the individual industries. But then when you uh, make this more explicit, you can see that changes in the alphas and betas and the shares can have a profound impact. So if, for example, you can have a bigger share of your exports devoted to products with a higher income elasticity, you would raise your uh, balance of payments constraint uh, uh, growth rate. Also, by the way, notice that the uh, equilibrium growth rate here becomes time varying. Uh, well, this relates directly to uh, conflict and, and cooperation uh, because, uh, you know, some goods are more favorable than others for exports. Uh, so, for example, things like textile apparel are very nice things to export, but they don't have very high income elasticities, whereas this is like my show and tell for undergraduates. So it's something like you know, advanced uh, information technology, cell phones, and, and whatnot. Uh, aerospace products have high income elasticities. Uh, so to make a long story short, if a country can get higher shares on the goods uh, for, for export, uh, on the goods with the higher income elasticities, and lower shares on those uh, items for imports, that country can boost its balance of payments constrained growth rate for any given world growth rate, but this could have deleterious effects for other countries if they are now not exporting so much of those products and they're importing more of those products. So there's an a opportunity for conflict recognized there. Although again, following Caldor's qualification, with more than two countries, several by specializing in different industrial areas could benefit simultaneously, but not everyone. Now, I'll talk about one more thing, and then I'll have to bring this to a close. Uh, in the canonical third wall model, as I told you earlier, uh, they get rid of the relative price effects with one of those uh, two assumptions. And uh, the advocates of this approach have asserted very strongly that only qualitative competition matters, at least in the long run, and relative price competition or real exchange rates are not effective or have no, no role in the long run. Um, but you'll note if we go back to the math, 
that what they're talking about having no effect, getting rid of, is continuous change in the relative prices or continuous change in the real exchange rate. And it is implausible that the real exchange rate would just depreciate forever and ever or appreciate forever and ever, but it's not implausible that the level of the real exchange rate, um, which I had in some slide here, well, uh, I lost it, but that the level of the real exchange rate could um, change over time and just have like a one-time shift from a lower level to a higher level, which would be, uh, the way I defined it, that would be a real depreciation if the real exchange rate increases. And so, um, in the last, I would say, 15 years or so, or more, a number of uh, theorists in this tradition have developed arguments that real exchange rate levels, not rates of change, but levels, can have long-run impacts in a BPCG framework. And we can identify three channels through which this can happen. So one relates to the multi-sectoral Thurwall's law, which I showed you a few minutes ago. Uh, that is, the real exchange, a real exchange rate change could alter those weights, the alphas and betas, on the different income elasticities and thereby change the weighted averages and affect the long-run growth rates. That's found, for example, in a paper by Setterfield and Osilik, uh, 2018, and Chimili uh, Pursile and um, somebody else who I should remember in 2019, Chimili et al., and many, many other papers. Um, a second channel would be a capital accumulation channel. Now, this requires more modification to the theory because in the uh, theory, it's a type of super multiplier model in the sense that investment's not an autonomous constraint. Investment just follows along through an accelerator mechanism. At least, that's not usually modeled very explicitly in BPCG, but it, it's implicit. But if you think that a country's exports might in fact be supply constrained, and therefore more investment is needed, and if you think that investment responds to profitability, and that, that's a big set of ifs, again related to Antonella's presentation this morning, uh, well, a real depreciation raises the profitability of production within the home country. And a number of empirical papers, I cite one of my own for the U.S. economy and one by Carlos Ibarra from Mexico from 2018, have shown that a real depreciation does raise the profitability of the tradable goods industries and encourages investment uh, in those sectors. And then, as Arslan Razmi showed in the 2016 theoretical paper, that would then relax supply-side constraints on exports in his model for small open economies. A third possibility, found in some work by uh, Missio et al., 2017, Marconi et al., 2021, the latter is an empirical paper, uh, is that a more competitive real exchange rate, a depreciated real exchange rate, could actually raise the income elasticities for export products. Not just shift the weights, but actually raise the uh, income elasticities themselves if they improve export quality in various dimensions like increasing innovation, technological upgrading, they call that the sophistication effects, and they also have a diversification effect, encouraging uh, the development of new products. Um, So there's been this running debate, this will be my last the subject before, before I close, about whether as sort of post-Keynesian economists we should include uh, real exchange rate effects as a type of relative price effects in our models or not. And as you have seen, they are important for telling some of these conflict stories in each time period. Uh, there's other ways to tell that story, but, but they, they make the conflict more, more apparent. Um, I wrote a survey paper on this, which is about to come out in the next issue of EGEEP, uh, if and when that issue comes out. It's called the July issue, but it's, it's, it's a little delayed. Uh, and my reading of the literature is that there's just overwhelming evidence that real exchange rate depreciation boosts exports. But 
The evidence comes with lots of qualifications. The effects vary by type of product, like manufacturers versus primary products, more technologically advanced versus less technologically advanced products or skilled products, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so here's a bunch of the great references plus my survey article. Um, and actually, I, I think that the paper, it was a, I think it was an FMM working paper uh, by Paraboni and Patronesi Meloni from last year is, is really nice because they, they, it's the first study, study I've seen that really explicitly compares, they have a proxy for qualitative competition and a, and a variable for price competition, and they show that both are significant, but they also analyze you know, more so under what, under what conditions. That's a very nice paper. Uh, but these are all good papers. There's also a huge literature uh, since about 2008 that has found that uh, real depreciation or avoiding overvaluation boosts output growth. But again, subject to many qualifications. Results are sensitive to all the usual issues about econometric specification. Most of the results, if you read them literally, they apply to medium run periods, not to long run periods. And there's a lot of asymmetries and nonlinearities. So it turns out it's really bad to have an overvalued currency for growth, but you may not get very big gains by trying to undervalue a lot. Um, but that's still important because your medium run growth gain, or growth spurt as it's called in some literature, can move your economy from a lower growth path to a higher one. Now, let me stipulate, I don't think growth ever occurs as smoothly, as smoothly as is shown in this picture, only for illustrative purposes. But if you have a lower growth path and a higher growth path with the same growth rate, and you move from one to the other through a you know, 10 or 20 year growth spurt, you have a permanently higher standard of living for your country's citizens. And I think that's a long run effect, even if the growth rate ends up coming back to what it was earlier. And there's this sort of dialogue of the deaf almost of some people saying, there's no effect on the long run growth rate. But to my mind, well, yeah, sure. But um, you know, if something affects the, the growth path of the economy, the height of the growth path, that's also a, another kind of long run effect. All right, well, I was about to tell you what to write your dissertation on, but I think I'm out of time. So I'm gonna have to let you figure that out on your own. Happy to talk to you about it. Um, <laughs> But I do think there's a lot of new areas this literature needs to go into. So to summarize, post-Keynesian models of open economies offer a lot of uh, insights into how and under what conditions international trade relations can be conflictive or conflictual, if you prefer that, instead of cooperative. Um, the various parameters and effects and elasticities in this model determine how important that is or not, or whether the conflict is stronger or, or weaker, uh, especially the more that real exchange rate effects or relative price effects are strong, the more possibility for conflict there is. If, if, if those effects are weak, as some people claim, then there's, there's frankly less room for conflict. Um, and then, the parts I didn't tell you about, but where you should be writing your dissertation, uh, is there's a lot of new features of the global economy that these older models don't take into account, or at least they're just beginning to, and I think are really important. And one is global value chains, to start to look at not just industries, but steps in the production chain and how those are divided among countries. And, and frankly, to get away from looking at countries and look at firms uh, that are managing their value chains around the world, and then the issue of the middle income trap. So I'll close with this thought. My reading of the literature is that those real exchange rate effects are really important for like launching industrialization and getting a country from low income to middle income status. They seem to peter out after that. And uh, you, you, you don't get beyond that with a depreciated exchange rate or certainly not with, with that alone. And on that, I will stop. Thank you all for your attention. So I guess I get to take my own questions. Um, and I'll probably answer them one at a time just so that I can remember them. Um, Alejandro? Is this, no, this is not on. Do, do I scream or? I, I can scream, that's. Um, 
Is our, are our technical friends here? Mira, te doy esto. Okay, there you go. Oh, Thank okay. you. Sorry. So, uh, Robert, great presentation as as always. So, uh, this might be a little controversial, but I think that the right way to think about conflict and cooperation is uh, game theory. Game theory is, you know, kind of really powerful to to think about why cooperation exists or not, right? So, if we take, for example, your the Macombi '93 paper, right, uh, the slide that you had where you showed, you know, where you have like the two countries. And we assume their decision variables are the fiscal stance that affects aggregate demand, right? It seems to me that what you show is that there's an Ash equilibrium where both countries benefit, right, from expansionary fiscal policies. So if that is an Ash equilibrium, you know, why don't the U.S. and China large kind of run defi high deficits to help each other? Uh, is, I mean, do, do you think that there's like a, a political economy consideration here that the model kind of doesn't take into account or... Or perhaps there are incentives to deviate uh, from that, from that national even where cooperation happens. So yeah. Um, yes, <laughs> there are. Thank you. That's it's a good comment. Uh, yes, there are political economy considerations. So first of all, there are interest groups. So for example, the financial sector might have interest in a financialized world. The financial sector might have interest in something that's different from what would be in the national or, or social interest. There's also ideology. I think you see that strongly in the monetary stance of, of in, in Europe, uh, inherited from Germany, I believe, and other northern European countries, and manifest in, in the uh, European Central Bank. I, I should let my Eurofre European friends say more about this than, than me, and I know things have modified somewhat since 2012 in the depths of the crisis, but uh, there's still a bias against expansionary policies, and also Europe lacks a, uh, a, uh, a, a, a Eurozone-wide fiscal mechanism. It doesn't have one. Uh, again, there's been a few baby steps in that direction, I think. But So, uh, like, during the COVID pandemic, the U.S. had quite a strong fiscal expansion, and I think... China, I can't remember what China did that. I know in the great financial crisis, China actually had the biggest fiscal expansion in the world. The U.S. had only a small one. But, yeah, politics and ideology, and I think Tom Pally's going to talk about hysteresis and these kind of things, you know, can make a, can make a big difference. We don't... We're, we're, we don't necessarily see that Nash equilibrium, or at least the powers, the, the people who have power don't necessarily want to move there. Yes, in the back, and uh, if I don't know you, you're welcome to say your name. Or if I can't see you, as the case may be. Yeah, um, I'm Hannah from the um, University of Berlin. I'm studying international economics now. And as you say on your last point here, that um, new features might be needed or new heterodox models, I wondered, also talking about ideologies, um, where do you see kind of um, possibility for a degrowth approach, like time analysis-wise? Are we more talking than could this be implemented in some way in a short run, or are we then more going to the long run perspective? And also, would you say that if we want to have some implement, um, because right now you were only talking about growth models, which is probably the normal thing in international trade models, um, also like the way we learn them, but still I think, especially if we talk about global value chains or stuff, is there some place, or could you imagine some um, place for also implement some degrowth ideologies. Thank you. So, I mean, there's no question the economics literature, both mainstream and heterodox, has always emphasized growth. And uh, if the world is facing ecological constraints, global warming, and so on, 
It's probably time to rethink that. I, I will admit I do not know much of the degrowth literature, so someone else would have to give a more full answer to this than, than I can. But we could reconceptualize what are the priorities in terms of policy objectives. For example, employment rather, per se, rather than growth per se. Although I think we sometimes use growth as this sort of shorthand in these discussions. Uh, but in reality, what we should be focused on are things like employment and living standards and ones that are sustainable living standards rather than making them perpetually grow faster. It's actually why I somewhat like my diagram about the medium run spurt because, you know, if let's say China kept growing at 10% a year forever, it would be un, you know, impossible. Even China has figured this out. They can't grow at 10% a year, but they don't need to. And uh, we don't have to push growth faster in terms of growth rate to raise living standards. We do have to have a, a temporary or medium run acceleration of growth uh, to do that. There's no question about that. So if you're gonna raise living standards in you know, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and so on, you're going to need a growth spurt. That's how it was done in East Asia or Europe in, in an earlier generation, earlier period of history. Uh, but you don't have to target a perpetually higher growth rate. And if we could find ways that maximize employment without necessarily having to have the fastest growth rate, that would be great. Now, there's, an there's a, a deep problem here, though. It's not so simple, because capitalism is a system that really needs growth to be prosperous. It doesn't do well in neutral, you know, it has to be in drive or accelerate. Uh, what did Marx say? Accumulation, accumulation, that is Moses and the prophets, right? Uh, the, the, the system needs constant expansion to create investment and to, to create jobs. And so you'd have to find a way to delink those things. And that might require a greater role, for example, for the state rather than private enterprise. So uh, these are just some random thoughts, but I, I'm sympathetic to the direction you want to go in. I'm just going to have to add it to my list of topics that the next generation will be the one to, uh, to work on. There was a question over here. Yes, and what's your name? Yeah, thanks for your presentation. Uh, Friederike Reimer, also studying uh, international economics at the Berlin School of Economics and Law. Um, I wanted to come back to your original point about uh, cooperation and conflict, um, then referring to like the more mainstream approach, emphasizing the cooperation and like mutual gains, and then obviously you should just let, um, trade and like not intervene with tariffs. And I was just wondering about the policy implications of the post-Keynesian approach and yeah, in regards to like export limiting or import limiting strategies like tariffs and also maybe industrial policy, if it's like a there's a normative need to improve your economy in a way that you're more on the corporative path or if there might be a case for protectionist arguments as well, especially looking at so-called developing countries, um, yeah, then just saying, yeah, just yeah, improve the, the goods that you trade and then you will get on the corporate of path or if there's maybe also like, like what maybe some arguments um, pointing to like colonialism and just, um, uh, yeah, just roles that countries are maybe stuck in. And um, yeah, I just wondered if you could elaborate on that. It gives me, your question gives me an opportunity to cover one of the slides I didn't get to. But first of all, let me say, how many hours do you want me to talk for? <laughs> because, I mean, that is, that's an enormous set of questions. They're all really, really great questions. Um, I, I, I think, you know, in the broadest possible terms, and again, I found this reading Caldor this summer, which inspired me because I had thought the same thing. But then I probably got the idea from reading Caldor 40 years ago in graduate school. Uh, you know, neither pure free trade nor just protectionism for its own sake is a solution, you know. So you're somewhere between uh, the, the neoliberals just open markets and Donald Trump, God forbid, you know, just put tariffs on everything. 
um, that doesn't help very much. But Caldor was quite specific that what you do need are, you know, selective uses of trade policy, industrial policies, um, and uh, but that opening the free trade is not a guarantee of mutually beneficial outcomes, and especially not a guarantee of long-run development outcomes. It, it may bring short-run you know, gains from trade in the, in the comparative static uh, sense. There's actually a literature in the Thorwall framework, an extensive literature on whether trade liberalization, that is you know, the deliberate reduction of tariffs and other trade barriers, mostly since the 1980s, uh, has produced, sorry, growth benefits uh, <laughs> Uh, in, in, uh, particularly in developing countries uh, that were pushed to do that through the IMF and World Bank structural adjustment policies in the 1980s and then through trade agreements uh, like NAFTA in the Western Hemisphere and, and many others. Um, so a, a, a few leading sources on this are Juan Carlos Moreno Briz from Mexico who did a series of studies on the Mexican economy, uh, Amelia Santos Palino and Thorwall in a 2004 paper, Penelope Pacheco Lopez, a 2005 paper on Mexico, and then I could go on and on. This, again, dozens of citations. Um, but what they found is that uh, an opening to more liberal trade does not necessarily increase and may actually decrease a country's balance of payments constrained growth rate. Uh, because even if um, export growth accelerates, and that usually does happen after liberalization. But the uh, income, elastic, income elasticity of import demand also usually rises, and very often by m more than enough to you know, overcompensate. It must be late in the day. <laughs> but by proportionally more than the, the export growth accelerates. So basically, the losses on the import side outweigh the, the gains on, on the export side. Santos, Paulino, and Thorwall found this in a broad sample of countries, and the other authors and many others have found this for the Mexican economy from its liberalization of the late uh, 1980s, which at one time was the, the poster child, Mexico was the poster child for, for trade liberalization. Um, so, you know, it, the, the message does undermine the traditional just lower your tariffs and everything will be, will be fine. By the way, I should say one other word about you know, the whole concept of a balance of payments constrained growth rate or BP equilibrium growth rate. It's not the, great, the rate your economy is actually growing at. You know, at most, it's some long run constraining rate. Um, but it's a type of sustainability concept, not environmental or ecological sustainability, but external sustainability. If your economy grows persistently faster than that, you will have uh, repeated uh, current account, you know, large and growing current account deficits, increasing international debt, and that is usually the path to crises and you know big uh, and very unpleasant changes in an economy. Uh, uh, Carlos Ibarra and I did a paper about Mexico, Cambridge Journal, 2016, where we looked at five, I think, five period or six periods of Mexican growth, and exactly how, when the growth was exceeding the BP constraint rate for that sub period, you saw the crises come in the next period. Um, so, the reason to try to raise your balance of payments constraint growth rate is not necessarily to actually grow faster but to maybe even just be able to grow at the same rate you're growing at now without having those balance of payments and, and debt problems. But I know I've only touched the surface of what you're talking about. There's a huge debate now about industrial policy. We're having it in the U.S. I know it's happening in other countries. Uh, industrial policy has been revived. Uh, neoliberal publications like The Economist are going hysterical. And the IMF, after a few little bleats about inequality is now back to being hysterical about the uh, uh, withdrawal from the you know, free trade uh, model. Uh, but countries are realizing that they need to pay attention to having domestic capacities, whether it's for chips and semiconductors or solar panels or, or whatever they're going uh, to need. And, you know, how to do that in a way that is more cooperative 
and not conflictive is, uh, is, is a real challenge. I mean, there's you know, lots of historical examples where these leagues uh, turn into national rivalries. But uh, you know, one thing seems clear, and that is if a few countries pursue very nationalistic policies and others don't, the others may get taken advantage of. So that's not a very good answer to your question, but um, much, much room for, for research there. All right. I think we still have time, right? Sorry? Here. Oh, here. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> right in front, uh, of, right me. in front <laughs> of my eyes. Yeah. That's the hardest place to see. <laughs> uh, and yeah, your I'm, name? I'm Leon Heckman from the Technical University of Munich. Leo? Leon. Leon. Yeah. Um, so I have two hopefully quick questions. Um, the first one was that when you were uh, laying out the imbalance of trade, you said that this is an uh, unsustainable uh, situation, uh, which I, of, uh, I agree. But on the other hand, we have at least the United States that consistently ran the deficit, uh, and there seems to be no real balance of payments constraint for them. So is there a part that this unsustainability gets moderated by the mutual acceptance of the other, other's current, other part's currency. Uh, maybe a quick comment on that. And then I'm, uh, I think Steve Keen made the argument that if you specialize in manufacturing, that you can actually gain a competitive advantage because um, it's not only price that matters, but also quality. So, I mean, you have like German uh, machinery, you have maybe Taiwanese chips, and these are the best on the planet. So it's not only price that moderates that, but also the, the, um, the I don't know, like physical quality uh, of that. Maybe a quick comment on how you would include these developments into your models. You've given me the excuse to cover yet another <laughs> slide that I skipped. Uh, but let me answer your first question first. Um, yeah, I've come to believe, and I, I know I published things to the contrary like 30 years ago, but I've come to believe the balance of payments constraint model does not apply to the United States. I don't think it applies to China either. I think these countries are so large uh, that they're really very unique cases and for different reasons. First of all, China just has huge trade surpluses and great export success and incredible you know, trillions of dollars of, of, of international reserves. Uh, so they're effectively not constrained. Um, and the U.S. economy has shown that it is able to just borrow a few hundred billion or whatever a year without limit. Um, and yes, having the, what is still the world's main currency gives the U.S. the so-called exorbitant privilege of being able to do that. So, so there's no question there are exceptional circumstances for at least those two very large countries. Um, the balance of payments constrained growth model was developed for sort of medium-sized European countries, and it's been applied to a lot of middle-income countries and developing countries that are much smaller and don't have that ability. So, I mean, for example, if you cannot borrow in your own currency, you're going to be balance of payments constrained. Um, and that applies to most, most countries. Um, but in the original writings on this, Tony Thorwald was always clear that there had to be at least one country in the world that was not balance of payments constrained. He used to use, back in the 70s, he would use Japan as the example. Today it might be US and, and China. Um, specialization manufacturing. Yes, I mean, it has this, this dual advantage that if things work right, and that, that's another slide I skip, but it can lead to self-reinforcing advantages both in productivity and lower unit labor costs and in product quality and innovativeness. But with a very important qualification which relates to global value chains. And cell phones like this are, are a great example. And I really commend to all of you, it's, it's not that well known, but it's a really wonderful paper by Durand and Milberg I think it's in, the, it's, it's in an interdisciplinary journal that we economists should read more and don't. Review of International Political Economy, I think. There's a, when you see this online, there'll be a reference list at the end. Um, they look at monopolization of intangible assets, which includes things like intellectual property, data centralization, network economies, et cetera, as a kind of new form of monopoly capitalism. Um, and they talk about the fact that in global value chains today, 
activities like innovation or branding or new product development, that's where the, the big income is. That's where the rents are. And those activities are concentrated in the US and a few other major countries, okay? Maybe Germany, Japan, China today. Um, but in the manufacturing stage, a lot of the production is offshored to either middle income or low wage countries. I mentioned cell phones because famously, well, mine is an Android, but if it, you have an Apple phone, large parts of it are assembled in China with parts made all over East Asia, but the design is done in the Silicon Valley in the United States. Now, where is most of the income going? To Apple in the US, right? Not to the countries doing the manufacturing. Um, Mexico has become one of the world's largest producers of automobiles. It supplies pretty much all the small cars for the whole North American market, large amounts of auto parts for the bigger cars and SUVs made in the US and Canada. Um, it supplies cars to South America. I don't know how much it sells in Europe, but you've got your own lower wage uh, assembly platforms here. And if, but the Mexican economy has been stagnant for 25 or 30 years. Okay, so there's this incredible growth of this leading edge export sector, and it's more and more technologically sophisticated, and its productivity has risen, but it doesn't spill over to the domestic economy. So something is going on where export sectors could become more enclaves rather than drawing in the, the whole domestic economy, and where the more um, rent-yielding, high high value added components remain in the rich country. And so through all of that, there's not a single automobile that's a Mexican brand. They're all American, European, Japanese, or Korean cars. So where are most of the rents going? To those countries. And then at the other end, the sales and the aftermarket services, that's also more and more in the rich countries. And those are the areas that have these intangible assets, and those are the areas where there's high employment of skilled labor, and that's what's being cut off. So when a country today gets a lot of manufacturing, be careful. It may only be getting the less uh, profitable, or, or I don't want to say less profitable, but the less income-generating uh, parts of the supply chain. And I think that's one of the factors creating the middle income trap that used to be, well, you industrialize and then you just moved up and you became a rich country. But now you can get blocked because you get stuck in some things and you never get to those, to those uh, uh, other things. And so I think there's a real need to modify our models to take in, that into account. There's one simple example, a fellow named Trigg published a paper in 2020 with an incredible amount of uh, matrix. You have to read this paper if you like matrix algebra. Uh, he's got a lot of matrices. And if you interpret what he says, I don't think he ever quite tells you, but the, 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 the bottom line is that countries with low value added in their exports have lower BP equilibrium growth rates. Because there's some, you know, he, he, the matrices manage to subtract, all the matrix operations manage to subtract out all the imported uh, intermediate goods. So if you don't add, have a lot of value added in your assembly work, for example, you're like Mexico and you, you don't get most of the gains. Um, but again, that's, uh, well, that was on my list of uh, dis important dissertation topics and future <laughs> research areas. And I believe it's time for the next break. So thank you all for your attention to all these lectures.